Welcome to our weekly roundup of the most memorable moments. From heart-touching stories to adrenaline-pumping adventures, we've gathered them all for you. Whether you're seeking inspiration or simply looking for a good chuckle, this compilation has something for everyone. So settle in, unwind, and relish the highlights of the week that was. And if you like what you see, remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. What are common things that almost everybody has done except you? Story one. I grew up in a crystal household. My dad, my sisters, my brother, their significant others and friends, my boyfriends later on, my sister's kids, all crystalled out all the time. I was the only one with a job trying to sleep and eat like a normal person. It was crazy. My nephew in prison has asked me numerous times why I never did it. Dude, what? It's not like they made it look good or fun, Jesus. Edit, to add, holy moly, guys, I didn't realize this post would get so much attention. Thanks for the well wishes and the awards. I survived and I'm doing great given the circumstances. I can't say the same for all the rest of the family. My sister and brother-in-law did get clean, but unfortunately, two of my nephews did not. One is in prison and one is off the grid, strung out on crystal, living on the street, pretending he's Rambo. But I'm proof the cycle can be broken. Thanks again for everything. Really psyched for you. That is no easy feat, and you are better for it. I'd wager it was easier than you think. I say that because people gave me so much credit for not drinking ever. The reality is, I was just afraid of seeing my parents do it. It's a bit of a coin flip. You either become repulsed by the behavior and avoid it, or normalize it and participate, but I would still lean towards the it's harder than you think category. Where I grew up in rural Australia, it was crystal and biker gangs, selling weed if you were a bit PG-13. If you had a family who participated in it, you probably became a career criminal too. I think not becoming involved is impressive regardless. It's a hard situation to shake. Mine was opiates. My mom, all of her siblings, my brother. My dad didn't do pills, but he was addicted to hiding on his computer, which eventually became online gambling. My dad was pushing them into bankruptcy with the gambling, while my mom was doing it by getting as much cash back as possible from the grocery stores and gas stations so she could buy more pills than the many she was getting prescriptions for. Watching them all trade pills, nod out during conversations, dig through each other's cupboards, looking for hidden pills at family functions, hide their purses so people wouldn't steal their pills. I am good at all of that. I'm with you, but came from a family of smokers, cigarettes, and drinkers. As I watched the smokers hack their phlegmy way to sleep, hack their way awake, hack if they did any extended exercise, choose to buy cigarettes rather than milk or bread for the kids, not to mention every one of the bad smells associated. I passed on that with only ever having taken one peer-pressured puff. The drinking was of the life-destroying, prison-time-getting, wife-and-child-beating, multiple-failed-marriage-having, drinking-yourself-to-death variety spread across multiple generations, so I've never had more than a few sips of white wine when wooing my now-wife in my adult life. <sighs> Folks, uh, when you come from families of addictions, and any of these addictions, the more severe illegal ones, and the kind of more socially accepted legal ones and stuff, it's really, really tough. And the best thing I can say is avoid that stuff if you can, um, because it, it never is as good as you think it's going to be. And if there is some stuff that you're just like, oh, but I, you know, I don't think drinking or weed or whatever is that bad. And it, it doesn't have to be that bad, but it's still something that you should definitely wait on in life until you're older. Um, and then you maybe have, you know, a little more control over it. It's not working your way into your developing brain, but best advice I can give is if you're coming from a family of addiction, avoid that stuff and your life will probably be better for it. Story two, move out of my childhood home. There was a guy in my neighborhood growing up who was around 70, lived in the same house he grew up in and still drove his first car, an old butt pickup. He was a cool old dude. He also told me his dog was the same one he had growing up, and I was a, I was little and gullible, so it filled me with hope and joy about my dog. I think he underestimated my stupidity and felt bad, so he told me the dog was different. When I was growing up, my dad lived in a house in the middle of a cattle farm. One of the neighboring farms had three brothers in their 80s who had never gone more than 50 kilometers in any direction. 
They still had a light truck from the 1930s that was in immaculate condition. My dad always said, because they've never taken the effing thing above 30 kilometers an hour. Loved those guys. Pure old school Australiana. LOL, I moved out at 19. My mom passed, I inherited the house and was going to sell it. Ended up moving back in about five years ago, still finding all sorts of stuff that she thought would be worth money someday. Honestly, as a guy who was homeless as a minor, it blows my mind when people inherit houses and then sell them. Like, I suppose you all buy new houses, but I've seen some people sell a house and become a renter, and I'm just like, why in the effing world would you do that? Unfortunately, even owning a home outright is a massive expense, which some people cannot afford. Property taxes, repairs, anytime you want to do renovations, which you're likely going to want to do when grandma never bothered to replace her linoleum floors from the 1970s, Plus, there are plenty of people that legitimately prefer renting than owning. Story 3. Pooped my pants as an adult. I know it's coming, and I consider myself privileged. As someone who poops their pants way more often than any adult should admit to, I find this comment hilarious. You have it coming, in my opinion. Broken my unbeaten run of not crapping my big boy pants going through chemo. It's ridiculous enough that you've just gotta laugh. Funny though, mentioned it at work, and while all the guys present were willing to hold their hands up and admit to it happening to them at some point slash share stories and have a laugh about it, even the usually stoic and serious guy who doesn't open up was willing to, which was a surprise. All of the women present strongly denied having any experience of it. I don't believe the numbers. I wonder if this trend of being willing to admit it holds true as a split between the sexes across the board. Just one of those random occurrences that gives you pause for thought. Story 4. I cannot whistle no matter how hard I try. I can't snap my fingers. Now I'm really curious if it's a physical situation that limits how your fingers move or if people have been explaining the moves wrong. Can you fold your ring finger so that its fingertip sits roughly in the middle of the blob of muscle on the palm between the thumb? And can you kind of press that fingertip into that muscle to make that finger's end joint flatten out roughly straight? Propping the third finger against the thumb will create that small gap between the base of the thumb and ring finger's fingertip. Can you aim your middle finger to fly to fill that gap when the thumb abruptly slides out of the way and lets the spring-loaded middle finger fly there? Yeah. Story 5. Gotten stung by a bee or wasp. Same here, still deathly afraid of them. It's nowhere near as bad as you learn as a kid unless you have an allergy. People grow up learning to fear them from kids, but it's really super minor by adult standards. The initial sting of a wasp is a surprise, and then it's just sore like a cross between a sunburn and a really big sore mosquito bite minus the itch. It's not so bad until you get stung for the first time on your bottom lip the day before your wedding from a bee that decided it was a good idea to climb down the straw sticking out of your tasty, tasty cocktail. Actually, I guess in the end it was a plus. It was like a 24 hour of lip filler for the bottom lip. Mr. Fact story time. I had one of the worst wasp stings bites that I've, that I can ever recall uh, back when I was about 17, 18 years old, because I was still in high school driving. And uh, as I did in those days during the summer, I wore nothing but the biggest, baggiest basketball shorts that you could find. And driving in my car with the windows down, and apparently a wasp got in up into my basketball shorts and st not too bad, but stung me high up on the inner thigh while I was driving like 50 miles an hour. I'm hitting brakes. I'm like swerving and like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so the pain was obviously quite bad. Tis a tender spot meant only for kisses and nuzzles, but, uh, the pain, the shock, the panic of like driving and trying to like pull over and also knowing that there is a live insect that has bit my inner thigh and could move upward. Worst experience you can imagine. <laughs> Story 6. Gone trick-or-treating as a child. It was forbidden by my church, so my parents would shut out all of our lights and my brother and I would sit up in his room and watch all the other kids out walking around in their costumes. I have my own kids now and we trick-or-treat, carve pumpkins, give out candy, the whole nine yards. 
Do you dress up with your kids and get candy now? We didn't get it either, and I quote, Fat kids don't get candy. My sister and I were both heavier set children. I've always wanted to go, not for the candy, I just wanted to dress up. It wasn't really a thing in my country, plus my parents are religious and our church probably would have banned it too. Glad you get to experience that with your kids, though. Story 7. Probably break a bone. It at least seems common since I've seen tons of people with broken bones in school, braces, casts, crutches, etc. I never broke a bone till I was 41. I tripped, caught myself, and broke my elbow. Broke one pretty early on in my life. I was like four to six years old. My mom accidentally ran one of my legs over. Have you ever listened to a person talk for less than a minute and known you weren't going to get along with that person? What did they say? Story one. She showed up to a little get-together, and the person who invited her said that they would be taking bets on who could sit with her for more than 30 minutes. Ten bucks per person, winner kept the pot. I assume they were just being rude and planned to tell her of her friend's plan as soon as she showed up. She walked in, looked at me, and scoffed and asked if the gray car outside belonged to me. I said, yes. She told me that with the money that car cost, I could have bought something nicer. Okay, well, whatever. I went to get a drink and sat to watch the crowd gather around her. I already didn't like her, but she went on to tell everyone about how she could never date someone who had a crappy credit score or couldn't pay their vehicle off after buying it. Someone who wanted to quit the contest asked for a cigarette. She opened up her purse and showed everyone a fresh pack of smokes and then told everyone why she doesn't smoke and why anyone who asks for a cigarette is either too broke to buy them or doesn't plan ahead of times. The guy asked her for one of her cigarettes. She said no and put them back in her purse. She talked about all the cars she bought. Basically, her parents would co-sign for her and pay the car off to build her credit, and she would give them a few thousand to pay them back. She was nuts and wouldn't stop talking. I disliked her, but was also fascinated with her. She was super weird. Update. So I've gotten a few questions about this girl and that night. Also, who is Gina? There were something like 15 to 20 people there, and most entered the contest. I think the pot got up to 100 to 120 bucks. The winner was just some guy who I didn't know. He spent the money getting everyone McDonald's and beer, so he was pretty cool. She was about 22 to 23. She had just finished getting her high school diploma because she had dropped out to make money, according to her. I think she sold some milkshake things and fitness plans for some MLM. For those wondering what happened to her, I'm not 100% what happened to her. She wasn't uh, my friend, but she did show up to a few parties I was at, and she seemed calmer. She used to bring her own bottle of liquor and wouldn't share, which was kind of funny because on one occasion they caught her filling her bottle with a bottle of Jack that someone had brought and left on the kitchen counter, but she swore that all she drank was Hennessy and Fireball. If she doesn't smoke, why does she have a pack in her purse? And it's not even for sharing given someone asked and she said no. I'm not gonna lie. I started this video thinking, you know, I'm gonna hear a bunch of super judgmental people say some stuff and I'm just gonna disagree with them and be like, no, come on, you gotta give the person a chance. Story one proved me wrong. I, uh, I don't think I'd want to talk to this person. I, uh, I, I feel my body trying to like twist and recoil away from this story. So, I guess if there's a lesson to learn, it's don't be this person. Story two. Years ago, my ex-husband and I went to see a movie with an older colleague of his. Before the movie, we had dinner at a chain restaurant slash steakhouse type place. Staff on the floor was all 20-ish. I never met this man before, but in the first few minutes of sitting down and looking at the menu, he very confidently told us how he came there a lot and flirted with the female staff because they love the attention. The best part? His daughter worked there. All I could think was how I would literally cringe myself through the floor if I was 20 and my 50-year-old dad came into my place of work and pestered my coworkers because he didn't understand that they only put up with him because they're paid to do so. My papa would come into the restaurants that I worked in. I usually was his server, but once someone else got his table, my coworkers would fight to take him. My papa was a funny dude that left enormous tips and joked with everyone around him that was cool with it. He was one of those tall, skinny guys that just looks like a guy you could talk to. I remember I had told him about one of my coworkers having a rough time. He came in, specifically requested her, and then left her a $100 bill as a tip. 
When I got home, he asked if she had gotten the tip. Of course she had, and then broke down hugging me, telling me that my grandfather was the best person she'd ever met. She wasn't wrong. Reminds me of a relative's boyfriend's dad. He was a regular at the bar she worked, but got banned. Didn't get banned when he slapped another waitress's butt, same age as the girl dating his son, yuck. But the next night, he got banned after bragging to that girl's boyfriend about slapping her and trying to start a fight with him. All right, so uh, the, the, the OP and the second comment, don't ever be that person. Older guys in the 50s, I know that you can be gray foxes and you can be, you can, you can be pretty charming. I'll give you that much. Don't do this. If you're flirting with 20-some-year-old waitresses, um, you've gone from being like, you know, a silver fox to being gross, just gross. But to story number, uh, the first comment, part two of this three-part story, that person is awesome. Funny and polite, leaving big tips. That's how all of us should be in restaurants. It's so nice. Just make it a pleasant experience for everyone. Good on him. Story three. Literally last night, I was at a local pool comp and went to introduce myself to my second round opponent. We shake hands and his first words to me are, weak effing handshake, bro, followed by, I hope you like banter, mate, then proceeded to talk crap about every aspect of my game. The worst part was, he was actually good at pool, so it just seemed like he was generally a C. Some of his other opponents got it a lot worse than I did as well. Highlight of the night was when the comp host basically yelled in his face, everyone in this room effing hates you, which received a round of applause. He didn't seem to understand why that was. Just banter, bro. Edit. <laughs> the comp is 90% regulars that are there every week. This was the guy's first time playing there. He knew no one except for the couple of mates he brought. I can assure people calling me a liar that he was universally hated. He ended up losing the final, which received more of a response than the host yelling at him, but yeah, lol. I don't even know why I'm responding to this. I guess I've never had this much attention on anything I've ever shared on the internet. Hate when people use banter as a loophole for just straight up being an a-hole. Banter is cool and all, but when you can't read the room, haven't established a proper connection with the opponent yet, and talk in a way that makes it seem like you mean it, you're just a socially awkward person with main character syndrome. Story 4. They talk negatively about someone else in a very judgy way. There was this mom in my daughter's school who seemed to know everyone. She talked to me and she spoke so bad about these people. Then moments later, I saw her interacting in a friendly way with those she was judging. My eyes rolled so much I could see my brain telling me not to get involved with her. And I was right, because by the time school year ends, her friends hated her and they were talking behind her back too. A girl that used to be my best friend is like this. It was the weirdest thing to see her crab about all these people, then have Insta photos up a few days later with them. I didn't notice she did this until our friendship was on the line, so I asked other people if she did this, and they said yes too. That kind of betrayal hurts. I'm sorry you experienced that. Two-faced people are one of the hardest to deal with. Story 5. The parents of one of my kid's friends at school said there was a mouse in their house and his wife wanted him to kill it, but he didn't want to kill any creatures. He wants to make friends with them instead. But wife insisted, so he threw his shoe at it and eventually managed to hit it, but it wasn't dead. So he threw his shoe at it another four times. It still wasn't dead, so he poured boiling water over it to kill it. It still didn't die, so he poured boiling water over it again. It still wasn't dead, so he decided to leave it alone in the hopes that it would peacefully pass away. The logic of being too squeamish to kill something and then instead decide to torture it to death slowly in the most agonizingly painful way absolutely blew my mind. My cats were torturing a mouse and not killing it because cats are not human and such morals did not apply to them, I guess. Anyway, I felt so bad for the poor thing, I picked it up with a plastic bag and snapped its neck because I couldn't stand to see it continue to suffer. Did I enjoy it? No! Do I like killing things? Hell no! But I'd rather give it a swift death than watch it suffer. It was honestly one of the hardest things I've had to do, but I did it because it felt wrong doing nothing. Good lord! I mean... <laughs> I know probably it was just this person being maybe too timid 
And like, maybe this will do it. But it's like, my dude, if you want to just put a mouse or some animal out of its misery, you can't just give it like a timid little like, and be dead now, please. And you're suffering. Like, you gotta go all into it. As unpleasant as that might be, it reminds me of my dad came across like what looked like, you know, a bunch of cars parked up around along the side of the road. A guy had hit a deer, but hadn't killed it. And so my dad gets out, there's a crowd of people and this guy, like the deer, the back is broken. It can't move, but it's alive and in pain. And the guy was trying to like snap the deer's neck. They run into each other and trees at speeds that would uh, explode us. You're not going to snap its neck, you nut. And my dad went to his truck and got a hammer and just cracked the thing in the skull. Awful business. Terrible. But it put it out of its misery. Folks, you can't, you just, it's so unpleasant, but you just got to do it if you really want to make an animal not suffer. What are some harmless ways to F with people? Story one. I know someone who always takes an item to a party and leaves it somewhere in the house, i.e. a trinket or tchotchke. Good word. My aunt fills her medicine cabinet with ping pong balls whenever she has a party. Friend of mine once did this with an insanely overgrown turnip from her garden. Like this thing was literally the size of a child. She left it in the passenger seat of their truck with a seat belt on it. In the same vein, add a decoration to their Christmas tree. My mother and I do this to her mom. My grandmother is a stereotypical old white lady, for a little context, and we go to Lovers or Spencers or wherever and find the most inappropriate ornament we can and leave it on her Christmas tree, tucked off to the far side so she doesn't see it until she's taking the tree down. Our favorite true too includes Santa doing bicep flexes and just his hat and a stocking on his you-know-what, and Santa and Mrs. Claus with her skirt-up doggy style. <laughs> We get great enjoyment out of this, especially in January when my mom calls her mom for their weekly chat and grandma's going on about this ornament she found and she doesn't know where it came from. Mom has to mute the phone because we're laughing our butts off. We did this to a friend. I noticed when she bought her house, she had some prints in her kitchen of lemons. Two prints. That was all I needed. I went to a charity shop and bought maybe 20 cheap picture frames, then googled lemon art and printed them in color at work. My friend's birthday, we were outdoors and it began to rain, and the plan was to go to her house. I made my excuses and hopped in a taxi home to drop off my stuff and picked up a literal box of lemon pictures. We coordinated. My friend let me in and I began ninjing through her house, dropping and hanging lemon pictures throughout her house, sneaking into a crowded room and this is the piece de resistance stance, setting up a photo of her, delightedly holding an armful of lemon and limes my friend had taken weeks before. And then we wait. At a later point in the night, I bumped into someone I'd never met before, and he said in a hushed tone, have you noticed she seems to be obsessed with lemons? And I had to admit conspiratorially that that was something that had piqued my curiosity too. Practically every room in her house was partially lemon themed. That's my fave prank I ever pulled off. I absolutely adore that and think it's amazing. I did something like this that admittedly was more obnoxious and you shouldn't do. I think I've mentioned it on the channel before, but uh, a uh, couple friends of mine, they were going on vacation to Japan for a week and their mother was watching their house. Uh, their mother let me and two other friends in and we had taken pictures of our faces, cut them out. There were... 300 total pictures of our faces and we hid them everywhere some super obvious they were just like hanging from chandeliers and like on the toilet seat when you lifted it up some tucked away in books and all this and that and i put a note on their front door the day they were coming back that said welcome to the night of 300 faces the one friend was searching for hours when he got home exhausted from the flight i felt kind of bad um, his wife was laughing about it, but they never found all 300 faces. But I do recall literally like a year and a half later, uh, we were sitting together playing some tabletop role playing games and we're like, oh, we need, uh, we need this book. So he went to his bookshelf, grabbed it, was flipping through 
and a copy of my face fell out of the book onto the table, and he stopped and he looked at it and just went, God damn it. (laughs) Worth it. Story two. Oh man, do I have a story. In my freshman year of college, my roommate was a very neat and orderly person. He had every pencil in place, every paper had a folder, and everything got neatly packed away. We were pretty amicable towards one another, even with my messy living. At first, when he would leave for classes, I would admire how tidy his desk was and thought to myself, I should F with that. For the whole year we lived together, I would sneak used staples everywhere on his stuff. Homework folder? Staple. Pencil case? Staple. Backpack? Staple. Shower caddy? You bet that pube-infested bar of soap got a staple on it. Hell, even the TV remote got a staple in between the batteries so when they died he would eventually find another. I did it often, but was careful to space the staple events far enough apart to not raise suspicion on myself. I further protected myself by making a huge deal of having to borrow the -the across-the-hall neighbor's stapler whenever I needed to bind papers together. About March of our second semester, he had become insanely suspicious of anybody with a stapler and watched them like a hawk. The straw that broke the camel's back, I had asked him one night what his plans were under the guise of having a companion over for a visit. He said after dinner he had to go check out some obscure book at the library. When he left and headed to the dining hall, I snuck off to the library, found the obscure book he needed, and clicked a staple into it. He gets back to the dorm room, and I'm doing homework in the same spot where he had left an hour earlier, claiming the meetup didn't end up happening. He sits down at his desk and opens up his newly rented book, and tick, I hear that staple fall out onto his desk. All I hear after that is, yo, where the have all these goddamn staples coming from? I reveal myself after graduation when I mailed him a birthday card with a used staple in it. Thankfully, he got the biggest kick out of the card, and we still talk daily. This made me cackle. This got a genuine laugh from me. Well done. What a harmless, evil prank. Yeah, I'm all for pranks like this. There are a lot of pranks that you shouldn't do. They go too far, and they're just crappy to people. But, I don't know, these little, like, almost mystery ones that are just a little mischievous and yeah, Those are the pranks that I love to pull, because... It's the kind of prank you do to a friend. Story three. After giving a compliment, say, no offense, and watch them struggle to find the non-existent insult. Comment is hilarious. No offense. This has been an inside family joke of ours for 30 years. One time at Thanksgiving, an old aunt was telling a story about being in line at a bank. She said the person in front of her was big, fat, and ugly. She turned to my mom, said, no offense, and then kept on with her story. We spent the night trying to figure out which one of the horrible adjectives was so relevant to my mom that it warranted a no offense. From then on, whenever someone describes an item as big or fat or ugly, we have to turn to one of our family members and say, no offense. It's quite charming now. Story 4. When driving, I like to wave at random people as if I knew them. Hilarious to see instant confusion on their faces. I used to wave at random cars if I liked the car. I pass this really nice old Chevy every day on the way to and from work. We now wave to each other every time. When I was little, my mom let my sister invite one of her friends on vacation with us. When we were driving, my sister's friend said, I've got an idea. Both she and my sister had long hair, so my sister's friend took out a brush, brushed both of their hair in front of their faces, then each put on sunglasses. My mom stopped at a traffic light, and at the same time, my sister and her friend turned to the car next to us. This woman happened to look over, and I watched her jaw drop that she was coming face to face with not one, but two seemingly cousin its. Then I watched this person start cracking up. We were the first car, and light changed right at that moment. The best part was my sister and her friend keeping their composure and not turning away from the person as we pulled away. Waving at people when you're driving or like when you're walking around doesn't sound like a prank to me, but I've grown up and lived in Minnesota most of my life where if I'm just walking around any neighborhood and I see someone driving and I'm just like, hey, they're like, hey there, like Minnesota nice, baby. I mean, it's probably not actually nice. They're probably suspicious of the weirdly dressed bald man in their neighborhood, but eh, we still wave. No prank there. Story 5. Carefully step over a non-existent obstacle. Do this at a crosswalk when the cars stop too close. 
I have to save this one for a few years for my kids to be old enough to corroborate, and we do it to my husband. My brother-in-law and his sons like to stare at non-existent wildlife just to trick strangers into looking for it too and maybe thinking they're going crazy. Like staring up at a tree and saying, oh wow, a kookaburra. Story 6. Say, no pun intended, after a sentence where there was clearly no pun. This meatloaf is amazing, Sharon, no pun intended. For some reason, this makes me think of the guy who randomly used the word perchance in an essay. If someone says no pun intended, I always respond with, oh, none taken, and enjoy seeing them confused. Story 7. When you shake someone's hand, move yours left to right. As they do the traditional up and down, a hilarious circle ensues. I can't believe I've never thought of this. Totally left-right handshaking from now on. Story 8. I put a tiny piece of masking tape over my coworker's mouse laser on April Fool's Day one year and wrote April Fool's on it. He troubleshot every single thing except examining the mouse. He eventually called IT, who simply turned the mouse over and pointed it out to him. Plug in a second mouse, leave it under their desk, but so you can reach it with your foot. Kick it occasionally. I plugged a wireless mouse onto one of my college professor's computers and moved the mouse around every time he wasn't looking at the screen. Did this for a few days and always took back the USB at the end of class without him noticing. Finally, when doing my final presentation, he realized what was happening when I took my own mouse up with me to click through the slides. What is a harsh reality that everybody needs to hear? Story 1. You can become disabled unexpectedly at any point in your life. Make sure you're taking advantage of the abilities you have while you have them. This is scary. It is. I saw it happen to my mom in her 50s, and then it happened to me in my 20s. Don't let life pass you by. Enjoy every bit of it while you have a body that allows you to do so. I don't regret any of the things I paid to experience before I got sick. It really is. I went from being a perfectly normal 21-year-old, full-time college, full-time job that was actually well-paying, volunteering as an EMT every weekend, would go on long walks with my dog multiple times a day, and a decent social life. One day my hands stopped working. My boss sent me home saying she wanted a doctor's note for me to come back because she was worried about me. Ended up in the hospital for the weekend, but they found nothing. Took a few months, but I got diagnosed with combo rheumatoid slash psoriatic arthritis. They hoped it was a late onset JRA, so I went through eight months of hellish medication before they confirmed that it wasn't. This was my life now. I have ups and downs, but thanks to the pandemic putting me out of work, I could finally qualify as a dependent and get financial aid. Now that I'm about to graduate, my body went, hmm, but... What if we got another debilitating autoimmune disorder? So on top of RA slash PSA, Ehlers-Danlos, celiac disease, asthma, psoriasis, chronic migraines, long haulers from COVID three times, Raynaud's, and all the side effects from the meds for those, I now also most likely have ulcerative colitis. Never take your health for granted. Take care of yourself and live life to the fullest. This comment should rise like cream to the top. Seriously, the human body is amazing, resilient, and beautifully intricate. It is also fragile, complicated, and fallible. Never, ever ride in a car with your feet on the dash. Don't light those M80s in your hand. Don't dive headfirst into unfamiliar waters. Life is already trying to kill or maim you. Don't give it any help. Signed, someone that has witnessed a handful of level one traumas and studying to become a surgical scrub. These folks aren't joking around. I've definitely known people in my life who, you know, completely quote unquote normal, um, you know, one day and some accident or even not an accident, just some disease or something latent in their body that was genetics took effect and they lost some abilities that they have. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't still live a perfectly normal, fulfilling life. You know, that's why I put little quotes around normal. There are so many people out there that live lives with, you know, various hurdles that they need to overcome, but they can still live happy, amazing lives. But if you're used to living life without those hurdles, they can kind of get you down and come out of nowhere and they can be a little bit, you know, soul crushing. So make sure you enjoy what you have while you have it. But if something does happen, keep pushing forward. Life can still be great. 
Story two. This one is both harsh and comforting. People don't think about you as much as you think they do. That means that your feelings might be ignored or not considered. People will forget things about you and might not remember things you've done together that were very memorable for you. That can be hard to realize. On the other hand, they probably don't remember that embarrassing thing you did in high school, or they don't care about it. They notice patterns of behavior more than occasional bad days that you have. So those times you feel bad about being off with someone, they probably don't think about them unless they become frequent. Personally, I find that comforting. Nah, I remember when Name Redacted pooped in her white skirt in third grade and sat in it all day. I'm 39. Everyone is too busy cringing over their own mishaps to worry about that one time you did something embarrassing. One saying I heard a lot long time ago that really struck a chord with me is, what other people think of you isn't your business. As David Foster Wallace wrote, you wouldn't worry so much about what people thought about you if you realized how seldom they do. As someone who consistently worries what other people are thinking about me and has paranoia that everyone remembers every terrible tiny little thing that I did, I think I needed to hear this and I hope some of you watching this needed to hear this as well because yeah, as sort of like, you know, oh, that's that's kind of a mean thing to say. No, it, it really is a pretty comforting thing. Story three, your first relationship most likely won't be your last. When I hear young girls say their first boyfriend is the love of their life, I just smile. That was me, madly in love at 15 and thought we'd be together forever. It makes me laugh. Thankfully, my first relationship was loving and respectful enough to make me hopeful for the next. It's funny, I was very much in love with my first boyfriend. He meant a lot to me. Sometimes I'd fantasize about getting married and spending our lives together, but always, in the back of my mind, even at 16, I was like, I'm not gonna marry my high school sweetheart. LOL, a pragmatist from the womb. I didn't expect mine to be, but 16 years later, here we are. The fact that we've grown and changed tremendously is something of which we've remained very conscious, however. Time and transition are inevitable forces which must be treated with due reverence. We do yearly, or more often as needed, state of the relationship check-ins and wait to get married until our late 20s, early 30s. I'm far from a relationship expert, and your mileage may vary, but it's worked for us so far. Edit to add, seriously, don't get married right out of high school. If we had, our relationship may not still exist. Story 4. Life is not automatically easier just because you're a good person. Expecting life to treat you well because you're good is like expecting the bull not to charge at you because you're a vegetarian. I find the inverse is usually true. Having a moral compass and being a good person usually means you have a line in the sand somewhere and there will always be someone who is willing to go further than you, undercut you, or outcompete you. This. People who are at the top are usually either corrupt or got extremely lucky. A radio station I used to listen to about 10 years ago had this discussion. High-level executives at the CV level had to be an a-hole to be at that level. It got tense when the president of the radio station came in to discuss it, but he agreed. In that position, you often have to make hard decisions and, to put it bluntly, no one cares what others think. Story 5. You Gotta Walk Your Dogs I heard someone put it this way, which really hit home. To you, it may feel like a chore, but to your dog, it's probably their favorite part of the day. My dogs live for their walks. Working from home really made that blatantly obvious. I used to skip walks sometimes, but after seeing them all day just waiting around to sniff the world, I don't skip walks anymore. That and my one girl is getting older, and you realize how much they deserve while they're here. I have doubled the park trips, too. Yes, please, adopt a dog whose activity needs realistically to match what you will do. High-energy dogs shouldn't be adopted into families that cannot adequately provide them with enough exercise. Walking is also not just about exercise, but mental stimulation. If you don't take your dog on long walks, adopt a little senior pup and take one leisurely stroll a day. Yeah, beyond just walks, folks, make sure that if you are getting a dog or a cat or whatever, that you can't just keep them alive, but you can actually provide a good life for them. Um, you know, I take, I have two dogs. I take them for a walk every day, unless it's like really cold out because that's dangerous. Uh, but yeah, walks every day. We are, we're very lucky. We have a big backyard and so our dogs can go out there and run around. We run around and play with them and stuff. And we're lucky to be able to give them that life. 
some of you folks have dogs like in apartments and stuff, it's all the more important that you be able to take them on walks and all that kind of stuff because they need that stimulation. It's important for them and it's also just nice. And if you have a dog, don't you want them to be happy? Story six. Some people will hurt you and they won't care how you feel about it. Sometimes you're the bad guy. Holy crap, this blew up. I had this realization last night. My two-year-old said he was done with his cheeseburger. I knew that was untrue, but I ate the remaining quarter anyway. Two minutes later, he was devastated. This one, and I think it has a sister. Just because you're peed off doesn't mean it's someone else's fault. Sometimes you're just being an unreasonable F face. Don't sweat it. It happens to all of us. But if you keep telling the story where the other person is the bad guy, you probably never learn a lesson and stop acting like an unreasonable F-face. Story 7. You can love someone with all your heart and not be loved back in the same way. I wasted a lot of time in my life either being too stupid to learn this or, at the very least, too stubborn to admit it to myself. My stupid heart has decided it would rather go the rest of my life pining over the one I don't have than move on. My head is furious. My lungs are indifferent. Time is the ultimate currency, friend. You can't have more. Spending it on someone is the ultimate show of love, but reciprocation is important to all relationships. Do you think that after all the time you've spent, that has gone unrequited if this person were to one day realize the potential you've known for so long that it would feel the way you hope? My experience is that it does not. Go out and live. Pursue passions that don't rely on the whims of others. Hopefully, somewhere along the line, you will find someone you feel strongly about who recognizes the value of the time you want to spend with them. If not, you've still lived a life you can be proud of. What's worse, you can love someone as much as you're able and they can love you the same way, and it can still not work out. What was effing awesome as a kid but sucks as an adult. Story one, getting letters. I wanted to get letters as a child, but now I'm happier when I don't see them. Now it's always someone who wants my money. Instead of relatives slipping you a few bucks. My brother-in-law sent $20 cash to my son for his 10th birthday, and the envelope arrived torn open with no cash. I never thought I would commit murder over $20, but it's a good thing I don't know who did it. Makes me think of this joke. There was a man who worked for the post office whose job was to process all the mail that had ille illegible addresses. One day a letter came addressed in a shaky handwriting to God with no address. He thought he should open it to see what it was about. The letter read, Dear God, I'm an 83-year-old widow living on a very small pension. Yesterday someone stole my purse. It had $100 in it, which was all the money I had until my next pension check. Next Sunday is Christmas and I had invited two of my friends over for dinner. Without that money, I have nothing to buy food with. I have no family to turn to, and you are my only hope. Can you please help me? Sincerely, Edna. The postal worker was touched. He showed the letter to all the other workers. Each one dug into his or her wallet and came up with a few pounds. By the time he made the rounds, he had collected $96, which they put into an envelope and sent to the woman. The rest of the day, all the workers felt a warm glow thinking of Edna and the dinner she would be able to share with her friends. Christmas came and went a few days later. Another letter came from the same old lady to God. All the workers gathered around while the letter was opened. It read, Dear God, how can I ever thank you enough for what you did for me? Because of your gift of love, I was able to fix a glorious dinner for my friends. We had a very nice day, and I told my friends of your wonderful gift. By the way, there was four dollars miss missing. I think it must have been those robbing bastards at the post office. <laughs> My husband and I moved earlier this year, and I sent out little We've Moved postcards to our family and friends just to let them know what our new address was, not to try and get anything from them. But the number of people who sent us checks, cash, or even little gifts was astonishing. I was so excited to open mail those days. Meanwhile, I just had a birthday this week and only got two cards in the mail. Why, at 35, I thought I was going to get more was beyond me. But I checked that damn mailbox all week looking for cards. Not money. Just a nice card to open.
I've decided I want to be the person who mails my friends cards and stuff, so I've accumulated a stock of cards and postcards and wrote all their birthdays in my calendar and have started sending birthday cards out. I also send sympathy cards and stuff just because I'm sick of relying on Facebook as my way of connecting with folks. I don't know if I'll get my cards on my birthday, but they have my address and it'll be nice if I do and okay if I don't. I'm happy it makes them happy. I, I don't know if it's just me, but <laughs> I am 39. I am going to be 40 when you see this video within a week <laughs> or so, uh, maybe a couple weeks, but guaranteed I'm going to get some birthday cards from like my parents and relatives and they're going to be sending me money, which honestly at this age feels kind of weird. I'm like, Seriously, you, some of you are on like retirement and stuff. I have more money than you. Please keep your money. Do nice things for yourself. That would make me happy. Story two, spinning in circles. I try to do that now while holding my little one and I do about two spins before I'm lightheaded and dizzy as a drunk. Turning my head too fast makes me dizzy and nauseated, LOL. This is an excellent comment from seven years ago by Sean Sanders about why adults get dizzy when kids don't. There are many reasons for this in general, such as lack of reflexes and fine motor skills due to aging, which prevent your body from autocorrecting itself when it gets off balance. But specifically for what you're asking about spinning while sitting, it has to do with your inner ear. When you tilt your head to the left, your body knows that your head is tilted left because it can sense it. If your eyes are open, you could sense it just by seeing that everything is not tilted. But if you close, you would still feel that you were tilted. Even when you pass out and wake up, never remembering having gone to sleep, as you awaken, you can sense which way you're oriented. Your body accomplishes this through the use of liquid-filled tubes inside your inner ear, which stimulate nerves as the liquid levels itself with gravity. When you're young, you have more blood flow to all various parts of your body, and your inner ear sensors are healthy and plentiful. As you age, however, you start to lose sensitivity in those nerves and sometimes lose nerves completely. This makes it so your inner ear sensor is less precise than it was when you were younger, which means when you really shake it up, like spinning in a chair, it can take a little longer for it to sort itself out and figure out where you are oriented. Additionally, people can develop debris inside those liquid-filled sensors, like calcium buildup, really tiny rocks. Those end up sloshing around with the liquid as well, and as they interact with the liquid, send false signals to your brain via those nerves. In other words, people with healthy inner ear sensors will have much better balance than those with less healthy sensors. And as we age, our sensors become damaged or at least less precise. Edited to add my own comment, Adults are also more likely to be on medications, sometimes multiple medications, that make you dizzy or affect your balance. As one of those folks, I highly encourage everyone to do balance exercises. It is possible to improve your balance at any age, and it improves pretty quickly. I was so surprised by this as an adult. Spinning and roller coasters are fun as a child. I tried that as an adult with my kids and felt like I was going to die. The dizziness takes so much longer to go away and you feel terrible the whole time. I came here to say this. I've been getting a season pass to Kings Island for years from high school into my late 20s. And I rode all the rides, even the spinners, with no problems. I took a few years off during the pandemic and didn't go at all, but decided to get season passes again this year. I'm only 32 now, but damn, crap hits different, and not in a good way. I was getting motion sickness on even the simplest of rides. I didn't even attempt the spinners. Left the park with a massive headache and sadly haven't returned this season. I'll probably take my daughter and her friends to the Halloween haunt, but I don't see myself riding too many rides. What the F? Nobody told me 32 was old. Just for a twist, you know what I love as an adult that I wasn't as interested in as a kid? Learning interesting facts like that about like the inner ear and calcium buildup and stuff like that. I mean, I liked learning okay as a kid, sure, but as an adult finding out this kind of stuff, I'm fascinated. That's great. Becoming adult is awesome. Ooh, oh, my shoulder hurts because I slept wrong because I'm old. Story 3. Waking up in another place when you fall asleep. Not to get sappy, but I used to love when my dad would carry me into my bed after falling asleep in the car or on the couch. I would wake up when he was carrying but pretend to be asleep. It was such a nice feeling. 
he walked out on us right after my baby brother was born. My mom became pretty jaded and emotionally distant and would just drag him into bed whenever he fell asleep because she did not like carrying him to bed. I used to make it a point to carry him into his crib as gently as a 12-year-old me could. Hope the little dude had that feeling too despite being in a broken home. Reminds me of when I was younger. My older brother would carry me to bed as my dad had a bad back and I was very much my brother's little princess. Unfortunately, he got with a woman who was mentally unwell and he hasn't spoken to us for over 15 years. Sometimes I wish I could go back in time 30 years so I could snuggle my tiny face into his shoulder. I'm so sorry you lost your relationship with your brother. I've seen that happen firsthand, and it's terrible. I'm an only child and always wanted a sibling. My cousins don't speak to each other anymore because the woman my one cousin married is a gigantic thunder sea and has broken him down and abused him so badly that he's lost the will to stand up to her. So he's let her estrange him from his sister and most of the rest of the family, actually. What I wouldn't give to get that bee in a room and have it out with her. But now they don't come to any family functions, so I don't think I'll ever get a chance. Sometimes I fall asleep on the couch and my girlfriend moves me to the bed, but I'm so far out of it I don't realize what's happening. When I wake up next to her in bed the next morning, I feel happy and comfortable. Edit. I walk to bed with my eyes closed. She directs me and gives me words of encouragement. It's not really fun for her. She says, Sleepy Alpha Du Hurtley is an a-hole. Sometimes I fall asleep on the couch and wake up on the couch and I'm still confused as to why I'm on the couch. And why does my neck hurt? And my glasses are bent. Who left the TV on? And why is the cat on my face? Story 4. Having 100 bucks in your bank account. Edit. Thanks for the awards. Noticed a few upset comments and just want to explain a little further. Used 100 bucks because it's a term I thought most users would be aware of. 100 Danish currency would be about 13 US dollars. Didn't intend to belittle anyone. Sorry it came off that way. I remember in school when I was 10, we had to write an essay on how I would spend $1,000 in a day. We all wrote about getting huge houses and fancy limos, buying all the candy in the store and throwing huge parties. The teacher must have laughed so hard. Edit. For an anecdote I just remembered, I was part of a Facebook group for London rental properties a few years back, as were some other internationals. This poor guy asked how much to live in London. Someone said it can be anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 pounds, depending on which area. The guy replied, for how many years? Right? I would have been stoked as a kid for $100 in my bank account. Now it's the biggest stress inducer ever. I wish I wouldn't have yearned to be an adult when I was younger. I miss my youth and innocence. I don't think the problem is wanting to be older. I think the problem is that young us doesn't realize that the magic feeling you have as a kid goes away. So seeing adults or teenagers having tons of freedom and money from kids' point of view seems like it would be the most amazing thing because they think that we still have that magic. But sadly, we don't. You people watched Big when the 12-year-old gets his paycheck and is so thrilled. They pay us this much or something. And his old co-worker, who actually is an adult, replies something like, Yeah, it sucks. I remember my friend's dad paid me 125 bucks for three days of back-breaking construction and landscaping when I was 14, and it felt like such a good deal at the time. I've lived a lot of years where I have scraped by and often seen $100 or significantly less in my bank account, often very shortly after paying bills on payday. And, uh, it sucks. And I, yeah. But as a kid, heck, when I was a kid, just having like five or ten dollars, I was excited. Oh, I could buy a pop at the grocery store or something like that, or get myself a little treat or whatever. Ooh, how exciting. And now if I just had five dollars in my account, uh, let's, let's go move on to happier stuff. What's a dead giveaway that someone is not a good person? Story one, when they cannot bring themselves to celebrate someone else's success. I had a friend like this. She was nice and seemed to like me. It took me quite some time to figure out the odd thing that was missing in our relationship. She couldn't be happy for me, not even a little. Yeah, good for you, or something like that. Just radio silence. We split ways. My, dra my dad treats every success as a contest. It's exhausting. 
My unscientific theory is that this comes from having parents who pit their kids against one another slash other people. My mom always made everything a comparison and a competition between her daughters because she's like this. Especially me as the smart one. My older sister was supposed to be the beauty and my younger sister the artist, so I got the most obvious pressure. For example, if I started working out, my mom would start too and then tell me how much further she biked or how much longer she walked. If one of my friends got a higher score on an exam, she'd want to parse out why and strategize how I could come out on top next time. Once I became a lawyer, her running into old high school friends' parents was the worst. She'd mention my degree and job almost immediately, then ask them what their kids were doing now so she could mention my career to show off. She'd then call me and tell me all about it. It's the only positive attention I ever got from her. It nearly destroyed me. All the stress and anxiety and difficulty supporting my friends' achievements. My younger sister and I both had a, to really work on ourselves in therapy to stop being like this. Our older sister is still like this, and we both have really limited relationships with her as a result. I give my mom almost no information about my life because it'll either be used to brag to her sisters about how much better I am than their kids, or be used to passively aggressively hint at how I could improve. Nothing is ever enough for her. Get promoted? Well, so is your sister, and when will you be the boss? And why aren't you thinner? These days, I'm a really big cheerleader of all my friends' achievements. Still have to actively talk down my mom's voice in my head about it, though. I would agree with you about 99%. Then there's the 1%, like my extremely socially awkward friend. He's a super nice guy, very intelligent, but he's not one for showing much emotion to his friends, for example. I just had my bachelor party, and I invited him because I wanted him to get out of his shell a little bit and have fun. Well, he came to my party, to my surprise, but out of all my buddies, he's the only one that didn't say congrats to me. I know he likes me as a friend because he does talk to me and ask me about my day or at least show interest in my life. I think he just struggles to show what he thinks could be vulnerability. It's very odd, but I would say he's a good person at heart. Folks, your life is going to be so much better if you don't think of everything in life as a competition. Not to say that you shouldn't try and, like, you know, pursue things and passions and, you know, try and, like, you know, push yourself to be better at stuff that you are passionate about, but constantly comparing yourself to others is just a great way to make yourself miserable. Uh, you know, if you do something good, just look at it in terms of what you did. Compare yourself to yourself. Are you better than you were before? Perfect. That's all that matters. Story two. It's always about them. They're always the hero or always the victim in their stories. Can't take criticism, but probably dish it out to everyone else. They're never wrong. I have a friend like this. He's a very weird combo of pretty giving slash thoughtful consciously, goes out of his way to help people, etc., but kind of subconsciously narcissistic. I think due to upbringing, he's narcissistic, but fights it. But yeah, 90% of what he talks about are minor interactions throughout the day that most people would just completely brush off that are apparently a huge deal to him and where the other party was super wrong. I'd say like two thirds of the time he's kind of in the right, but they're extremely minor and he's in the right based only on what he says. And like one third of the time he's clearly complaining about something completely normal that he looks like a D for making a big deal about. He's fun to be around in groups because we'll talk about other things and have fun, but one-on-one -on -one it can get exhausting just hearing him complain about one thing after another. I've noticed this about myself in the past several months, and it truly takes a conscious effort to avoid it. Hate it. It takes a lot of effort to be self-aware and strive for improvement. I hope there are people in your life who notice and encourage you, but if not, then good on you and don't be discouraged if you find yourself backsliding. Progress is rarely a straight line. Yeah, I think I can definitely suffer from this sometimes. I'll get so caught up on all these, like, just meaningless ways where I've been wronged by people or something, and I've got to tell people about it and make a deal about it, you know. I, I think sometimes I just like complaining and getting to, like, vent and rage about meaningless stuff, but every once in a while I think that's fine. You, you know, sometimes friends like to vent to each other. It can be even funny and stuff, but... Boy, oh boy, you, you can't make that an all the time kind of thing because it's, it's like pulling the steam whistle on a train or, you know, on like a semi truck or whatever, you know, blah, blah. Fun to let it off every once in a while. 
but if you just lay on it and keep doing it all the time, it's pretty annoying. <laughs> Story three, they constantly say or do things where their only justification for doing so is it was just a joke when called out on it. Ah, yes, the Schrodinger's douchebag. They decide if the offense or rude thing they say is a joke based on the audience's response. When people say it's just a joke after they say something obviously rude or hurtful to someone, unfortunately, my one married SAHM friend does this to many of her friends and family members, myself included. Her and her brother stopped speaking because her sister-in-law finally had the lady balls to tell her she's never liked her and she was sick and tired of all her rude, it's just a joke, crap. Once my husband and I were at my so-called friend's house for a get-together, she yelled out and pointed in front of everyone, saying I was her geriatric friend. I'm four years older than her. Everyone just looked at her and gave her a what the F look and some of her friends started giving her crap for it so she tried to backpedal saying it was just a joke. I gave her a look of disgust and said wow thanks. My husband and her husband weren't in the room when it happened and my husband said if he was there he would have told her to F off. Another time a bunch of our friends were together for a concert and she yelled out abruptly to me in front of everyone you're old. I was talking to one of my husband's co-workers at the time, and we both just gave each other a what the F is her problem look and ignored her. She wonders why we rarely, if ever, hang out with her. Her husband is awesome, always fun to be around, and is super nice. My husband says she's only like that around me because my husband and I don't have kids. I'm skinnier, and I look younger than her, so she feels inadequate slash threatened. I don't care how she feels, it's not an excuse to be allowed to treat someone with such disrespect. Story four, they remember you are their friend only when they need something from you. I caught a lot of people off like that when I realized they only hit me up when they needed me. Hey bro, you still have your truck? Need some help moving something this weekend. Nah, you ain't talked to me in five months. Go get a U-Haul. Edit, more context for those asking. Yes, attempts were made on my side many times to hang out prior to this. It was more of a buildup of BS over time that led to me just cutting them off. I had a friend like that in high school, would only ever hit me up when he needed a ride. I said no like two times and stopped reaching out to them ever and the problem solved itself. I didn't need to cut them off. They stopped being friends when I stopped being a pushover. I haven't heard from a friend of mine in over a year. She got her license at 34, got a car, and I guess no longer needed me in her life now that I didn't have to give her rides places. Sure feels that way, but we go back 25 years, so it's crappy to feel like someone would take advantage of a person for so long. Regardless, she did me a favor. I'm glad she's out of my life. Yeah, I think some of these can, yeah, just some friends kind of use each other, and I think it might not start off that way. People drift apart with time. Sometimes people that you're really close with, you know, in high school or in your 20s, you're going to drift apart as you grow older. I mean, one of my best friends throughout high school and my 20s and early 30s, we don't even really talk anymore. And it's not anything negative. We just drifted. But I think sometimes people hang on to that stuff and use this usefulness, you know, like, oh, well, I need them. So now I'll get a hold of them. Yeah, yeah. And they use it as an excuse to try and keep the connection alive. But sometimes it might be best just to Except that uh, you need to move on. Story five, nothing is ever their fault. My borderline narcissistic mom used to accuse me of this when I was a kid. She was consistently the one never taking any blame for anything. But when I'd call her out on it, this would be her retort, projecting her nothing's ever my fault behavior onto me. As a kid, you're simply not capable of figuring out how to counter that. This crap effed with me so badly. Everything is your own fault if you're any good. Ernest Hemingway. As someone who has been spending the last few years trying to recover from this kind of mindset, I would point out that it is extremely easy to swing too far in the other direction. Towing the line between, on one hand, always holding yourself accountable slash focusing on what you can fix, and on the other hand, just internally crapping on yourself over things that literally are not your fault is harder than one would think. Oh, so you've met my landlord. Speaking of which, another sign is if they describe themselves as a good person, nice guy, reasonable, etc., like said landlord has. Anyone who has to tell you what their supposed positive qualities are, be it upfront or especially as a defense when confronted with their own misconduct, which in no way matches up with these positive descriptors. 
please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.